Contested Bones, Part 12. We've been going through the book Contested Bones by uh, <coughs> Christopher Roop and John Sanford. More information is available at the uh, contestedbones.org uh, website. The cover looks like that. Christopher Roop on the left and John Sanford cooperated in this. And the prologue explains why the book was written in the first place. John Sanford um, was a world-class geneticist who believed in evolution until around the age of 50 when he realized the impotence of evolution, the fact it couldn't really do what it was said to do, and worse yet, the impact of genetic entropy, what you might call devolution, and then thought there couldn't <laughs> be that much time, but then kept being told that there's all this fossil evidence of man evolving from apes, and so, like a good scientist, he decided to look into it with a protege of his, Christopher Roop, who's done a good share of the, probably most of the work. Chapter one discusses the advancing apes icon, one everybody knows, the evolutionary story, scientific method, and taxonomic principles setting the stage for the rest of the book. Chapter two talks about the textbook picture, which follows Darwin's expectation in his straight line evolution. The field is now widely acknowledged to be much more bush-like, and some will, evolutionists will state that the ascent of man cannot be traced at present, and may not ever be traced. Almost all the fossils that re are reported to show evolution are contested. And then we went through the fossils. Neanderthals are essentially, well, they're really human. Homo erectus is essentially human. Homo floresiensis, uh, the hobbit is human. Australopithecus afarensis is simply an ape, with the human parts being the ones they didn't find. Ardipithecus rambidus is also an ape, with the human parts the ones they didn't find, which are different from those of Australopithecus, and you can't evolve from Ardi to Australopithecus reasonably. Homo habilis is a, probably a mixture of ape and human, or a false taxon. Australopithecus sediba is also that, and Homo naledi is in fact human, as human as, uh, uh, as Homo floresiensis. Uh, chapter 11 talked about modern humans living alongside of apes, and now with the footprints in Crete back to 5.7 million years ago. Which means if you're gonna create an, a narrative of humans evolving from apes, all of that stuff in the middle is really worthless in telling the story. And then we get to chapter 12 where he goes from simply arguing for a general creationist framework to arguing a short age creationist framework. And he takes on dating methods. Do we really know how old bones are? And his quote, it sounds like faith, not science, doesn't it? Interesting quote. <clears throat> How are hominin bones dated? We're gonna get through the first part of the chapter. We're gonna get uh, up to uh, and through potassium argon dating for this week. Paleoanthropologists have at their disposal multiple dating methods that are commonly used to date hominins. Some dating methods are used to determine the age of the bones themselves. To do this, they would use carbon-14, luminescence techniques, and DNA analysis. However, most methods do not actually bait, date the hominin bones themselves, but attempt to date things associated with the bones, such as artifacts, rocks, ash layers, flowstones, etc. These things may be dated using potassium argon or argon-argon isotopes, which is what we're gonna to cover today. Uranium series isotopes, paleomagnetic analysis, and biostratigraphy. 
Each technique has its own problems and is briefly summarized below. The potassium argon radioisotope dating method was the primary method used to establish the current hominin time frame. In the 1960s, groundbreaking paleoanthropological research was conducted at Olduvai Gorge, Tanzania. Lava flows that were interbedded, interbedding the outcrop at Olduvai Gorge were potassium argon dated. A decade later, similar fossils were discovered in the Hadar region of Ethiopia and in Laetoli, Tanzania. At both locations, there were neighboring layers of volcanic ash, or what they call ash tufts, which were dated using potassium argon and later the related argon-argon method. We're going to go through both of those. Many other key hominin sites and the majority of major hominin species in Africa, Europe, and Asia have been dated using the potassium argon or argon-argon method. Since the potassium argon method has played such a foundational role in establishing the currently accepted hominin time line, it will be the main focus of this chapter. Other dating methods have been calibrated to conform to potassium argon based hominin timeline. That sounds weird, but that is true. Contrary to common thought, the hominin dating methods are not truly independent dating methods. There's a great deal of cross calibration and data adjustment aimed at harmonizing conflicting dates. We're going to see some raw data on that that isn't in the book, by the way. <coughs> Paleo experts often use more than one dating method to date the same hominin site. In theory, the different dating methods should consistently agree when dating the same hominin site, especially since they are often cross-calibrated. However, as we will show, these methods routinely yield conflicting ages. Those dates that do not agree with the expected or desired age of a particular hominin species are very often discarded. This may be sometimes justified due to contamination, poor samples, resettling, event, resetting events, etc. However, when a date is assigned to a particular hominin based on a given method, and later it is decided that that date is problematic for the ape to man narrative, the very same bones will be redated using various alternative methods. And we're going to see that in a couple weeks. After many trials, a bone will be assigned a date that fits the, fits the paradigm, selectively using dates that seem the most compatible with the hominin time scale, while rejecting of dates that do not agree can lock a field into incorrect understanding. Selective use of data, whether it is deliberate or passive, is bad science. Selective use of data is a common snare and temptation for all scientists. The difference between precision and accuracy. Throughout this book, we have referenced the standard evolutionary time scale. For example, Lucy lived 3.2 million years ago. Outside of the field of paleoanthropology, it is generally assumed that the various dating methods used to date hominin fossils are extremely reliable. You send off a, you know, just like you get potassium from the lab, you get a potassium argon age from the lab. Um, <clears throat> few people realize that there are many problems with these dating methods as is acknowledged in the technical scientific literature. The truth is, the popular dating methods routinely produce conflicting dates. Behind the very sophisticated technologies that are used to date samples are many layers of questionable assumptions. Such underlying assumptions are rarely discussed when a date is published. And they're certainly not discussed to the fourth, year, fourth grade kids that are being taught this. The resulting dates are typically accepted as valid without reservation. Dates that are assigned to specific fossils are often reported with a very small or margin of error. This uh, mutation uh, that was not corrected, um, this gives the impression that since precise physical measurements are possible, therefore those measurements translate into equally precise dates. In reality, those small margins of error are uh, misleading. The sophisticated dating instruments are capable of providing extremely precise measurements. They tell us precisely about the exact nature of the specimen, that is, its isotopic composition, but not its age. Precision is not the same as accuracy. It is possible to be precise, but not accurate. Consider a rifle that is not properly sighted in. The resulting, tar the resulting hits on a target can be tightly clustered, consistent, controlled, precise, Yet still, they may all completely miss the bullseye, inaccurate. The same thing is true of dating methods. Physically precise measurements taken in the present do not automatically translate into correct dating of past events. Now, at this point, I have added my own illustration. This is not in the book. 
you can get an idea of something that is precise but not accurate. They're all very tightly clustered. To something that is accurate, in fact, if you average those three, you hit the bullseye, but it's not precise. The difference between relative age and absolute age. There's an important distinction to make between a relative age and an absolute age. The Hominin time scale was established based on the relative age of strati stratigraphical sequences, which can be correlated based on similar sedimentary characteristics or similar types of fossils and artifacts found within them. You find the same pig over here as you find over here. This is based on the law of superposition, youngest sequences at the top and oldest at the bottom, which is a reasonable assumption 99 plus percent of the time. Making certain questionable assumptions, it is possible to use index fossils or similar artifacts to determine whether separate sequences are roughly equivalent to each other in age. One can then reasonably infer the relative age of surrounding strata beside, above, or below it. The below it is older, above it is younger, beside it is probably about the same age. Yet to determine an absolute age, meaning the actual age of those sequences, a rock sample must be collected that can be directly dated using potassium argon, argon argon, fish and track, whatever. A, so the absolute age, for example, 1.8 million years old, plus or minus 0 0.25 million, so that would be, you know, 1. Actually, because of the 99% uh, confidence limits is about twice that, it would be 1.75 to, to 1.85 million years old, is determined separately by radio t isotope dating methods. Thus, it is entirely feasibly, feasible to accurately correlate stratigraphical sequences using relative dating methods, such as faunal correlations or paleomagnetic reversals, yet still obtain an absolute age, a radioisotope age, that is absolutely wrong. On a case-by-case -case basis, we can trust the stratigraphical methods used to obtain relative ages, even while we question underlying assumptions of absolute radioisotope dating. How does radioisotope dating work? There are at least three variables that must be known in order to date ash, rocks, or bones using radioactive dating methods like carbon-14 or potassium argon or argon-argon. These are initial quantity of radioactive atoms, the quantity of daughter atoms that decayed from the radioactive parent atoms, and the decay rate. The decay rate is measured by the half-life, which is the time it takes for half of any given amount of radioactive atoms to decay into daughter atoms. An hourglass is a simple way to illustrate the radioactive decay process. It's not precise, but it gives you an idea. Imagine the sand in the top chamber represents initial radioactive item, atoms. These may be called parent atoms. The sand in the bottom chamber represents stable atoms called daughter atoms. The rate that sand trickles down represents the decay rate. In an hourglass, the time it takes for half of the parent atoms, that is the sand particles, to decay into the daughter atoms is, let's say, a half an hour. Now the difference between radioactive dating is that it'll go three quarters in the next, and then seven eighths, and then 15 sixteenths in the next half life. So that's one major difference because in an hourglass it's got an hour, all of the sand will get through in an hour. So instead of being a straight line, a uh, measured amount that's going through, you actually have something that depends upon the, uh, upon the amount of parent atoms that are left. Radioisotope dating such as carbon-14 works similarly to an hourglass, with that exception. The, quanti the quantity of both the radioactive parent atoms, carbon-14, and the quantity of stable daughter atoms, nitrogen-14, in a given sample is measured in theory. In fact, they don't usually measure that, they just measure the ratio of carbon-14 to ordinary carbon. The half-life, which is the time it takes for half of the carbon-14 to decay into nitrogen-14 is 5,730 years, plus or minus 40, based on today's measured rate. 
Together, these three variables can be used to calculate the age of a sample, given certain critical assumptions. All dating methods critically depend on assumptions. All dating methods are only as reliable as the assumptions upon which they are built. To the extent that the underlying assumptions are routinely correct, the dating methods can be trusted. However, if any of those assumptions are routinely violated, the dating methods cannot be trusted. To be clear, we do not doubt the precision of the instruments used to measure the isotopic composition of the sample being dated. The instruments that are used to quantify atoms, for example, an uh, accelerated mass spectrometer, are extremely precise. This is undisputed. What can be disputed is the interpretation of the resulting measurement. What do these measurements mean in terms of the timing of past events? The interpretations of those measurements critically depend on a series of assumptions, which we just went through. If any of the underlying assumptions are not correct, then the dating techniques cannot give a reliable age. The radioisotope dating methods commonly used to date hominins, that is carbon-14, uranium series, potassium argon, and argon argon, all rely on the following cre cre critical assumptions. And we went through these, but it won't hurt to go through them again. Initial conditions, that is, no daughter atoms or decay products were initially present in the system, or somehow you can account for how many there were. Closed system, parent and daughter atoms cannot enter or leave the system. All daughter atoms measured must be derived from the in situ radioactive decay of the parent atoms. Or again, we have some way of measuring which ones were not. Finally, a constant decay rate, the rate at which the parent atoms decay into the daughter atoms, the half-life, must have been constant in the past and the same as today's measured rate. The hourglass analogy may be useful for understanding the nature of these three assumptions. For assumption one, the initial amount of sand in the upper and lower portions of the hourglass must be known in order to determine how much time has elapsed. But imagine if no one was present when the hourglass was turned over, just like there was, no one was there long ago when the rocks surrounding hominin sites formed, or at least they're no longer with us to tell. What if some sand was already in the lower chamber? In that situation, it would appear as though more time had passed than actually did. For assumption two, it is assumed that the hourglass is completely shielded from external influences. But suppose that in your absence, someone came in and added or removed sand grains from the top and or the bottom of the hourglass. The hourglass could no longer be considered an accurate indicator of elapsed time. If you add a bunch more to the bottom, you'd think it's been longer. If you take away a bunch from the bottom, you think it'd be shorter, and the reverse for the top. For assumption three, supposing someone came into the room at an unknown point in time and sped up the rate at which the sand fell into the bottom chamber with, by widening the neck of the hourglass, and then put it back to normal again. If one assumed the rate of flow, the decay rate, had remained constant in the past, they would have wrongly concluded that a full hour had passed when the actual elapsed time was much shorter. Some may be surprised to learn that there is a large body of evidence from the peer-reviewed scientific literature that calls all three of these assumptions into question. In this chapter, we will be focusing on the first two assumptions, which are especially relevant to the potassium argon and uranium series dating methods, the ones most commonly used to date hominin sites. But which, by the way, are the, the same two sets of assumptions that I challenged in uh, my book, A Scientific Theology. Potassium argon and argon argon dating. We're going to get down to one specific dating method. The volcanic rocks and ash layers used to date hominin bones allegedly formed millions of years ago. However, there were no eyewitnesses or other records to verify what the initial conditions of the system were. No scientists were there to measure the quantity of parent and daughter atoms when the rock or ash formed. Consequently, it can only be assumed that no daughter atoms were present when the rock last crystallized. Assumption one. It is further assumed that all daughter atoms measured today derive from in situ radioactive decay of parent atoms. That is assumption two. Um, and also that it hasn't been lost, and you'll find out that a lot of people think that it has. And we'll talk about that. Yet there are certain physical processes that can incorporate external daughter atoms into the system to yield exaggerated dates. In other cases, except daughter, excess daughter atoms may not be effectively eliminated from the latter, a lava prior to crystallization, resulting in samples that date significantly older than the true age. 
The potassium argon dating method is especially prone to these types of error. The potassium argon dating method is commonly used to estimate the age of volcanic material, granite, basalt, and ash, that forms when molten lava cools and crystallizes. The clock starts ticking when the radioactive parent isotope, potassium-40, becomes trapped inside mineral crystals and begins to decay into daughter atoms, argon-40. Prior to crystallization, it is assumed that all of the gaseous daughter isotopes escape from the lava. Geochronologists understand this is essential in order to accurately date rocks or ash using the potassium-argon method. And there follows a famous quote from The Age of the Earth by Brent Dalrymple. The potassium-argon method is the only decay scheme that can be used with little or no concern for the initial presence of the daughter isotope. This is because argon-40 is an inert gas that does not combine chemically with any other element and so escapes easily from the rocks when they are heated. Thus, while a rock is molten, the argon-40, formed by the decay of potassium-40, escapes from the liquid. Now, this quote actually has an interesting history. Uh, Bryn Dalrymple, of course, in the age of the earth, where he was arguing against short-age creationists for a long age of the earth. He didn't argue for evolution, he just argued for a long age of the earth. Um, um, although I think he's an evolutionist too, but you know, that comes later. Um, <clears throat> made this quote. It is, you might say, a polemical quote. And the reason I say that is because uh, in my book, which seems to be the first place, at least according to Google, that this uh, quote uh, appears, other than Dalrymple's book. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of other quotes that go with it. This is not in the book, uh, not in, in, in Ripson Sanford's book. Um, Guy and Schleicher, page 56, this is uh, absolute age dating. What is special about the potassium argon method is that the daughter nuclide is a noble gas, which is, not no, which is normally not incorporated into minerals and is not bound into the mineral in which it is found. Um, bound in the mineral. And notice they're a little bit more cautious. They are speaking to people who need to understand radiometric dating in general, and they're going to go into it professionally, or perhaps to try to understand it professionally. And so they're cautious about exactly, not normally incorporated into minerals and is not bound in the mineral. Not bound is true. Not normally not incorporated is, depending on how you view things, possibly true. Um, and then Dalrymple and Lanfair, um, this is potassium argon dating, state on page 46, a silicate melt will not usually retain, notice the usually, the argon that is produced and thus the potassium argon clock is not set until the mineral solidifies and cools sufficiently to allow the argon-40 to accumulate in the mineral lattice. Uh, notice, let's go back a little bit further. Here, when they're using it polemically, they get a little more firm in it. This is Dalrymple of Dalrymple and Lanfear. Um, the potassium argon method is the only decay scheme that can be used with little or no concern. Why does it say little or no? Because actually he knows better. He knows that it's little concern, but it is concern. Because he wrote a paper showing that. So, you know, it all disappears, don't worry about it. When they get professional, they say, well, not usually. In theory, the complete degassing of argon should leave only the parent atoms within the newly formed rock. On this basis, it is assumed that all of the daughter atoms measured in rock samples are the direct descendants of those initial parent isotopes. However, if there's even a trace of excess argon trapped in the crystals, argon from wherever, from before, uh, a sample can yield a date that is much older than its true date, depending on how much argon is trapped. 
This raises a, a, a critical question. How do we know that all the excess argon is effectively escaping the system, outgassing, before the lava, lava solidifies? Since we do not have direct access to the past, no one was present to measure the initial isotopic concentrations, there's only one sure way to test the validity of this critical assumption, by dating rocks of known age, which formed in recorded history. Numerous studies published in the peer-reviewed scientific uh, literature have done that, and the results are surprising. A noteworthy example is N Mount Nagaroho in New Zealand, Mount Doom in Lord of the Rings, the movie Aficionados. Um, a series of known lava flows occurred in the 1950s and again in the 1970s with no further eruption since 1975. In January 1996, 11 whole rock samples from five lava flows were collected. Care was taken to ensure each lava flow was correctly identified. The samples were prepared and sent to the respected Geochron laboratories in Cambridge, Massachusetts for whole rock potassium argon dating. The lab, that by the way is a commercial lab. The lab did not know the origin or expected age. However, the laboratory technicians were cautioned that the samples may have contained low argon. In other words, maybe it's going to be quite low and you probably should be prepared to report that. Um, potentially yielding a young age to encourage careful analytical work. Given that we know when the rocks formed, because we know when the eruptions occurred, the potassium argon dating should have yielded the true age of Mount uh, Nagaraho samples, approximately 20 to 50 years old. Well, to be precise, uh, it should have yielded age not statistically different from zero. However, the dated, uh, dated age of the samples ranged from a minimum of a quarter million years old to a maximum of 3.5 million years old, dramatically older than their actual age. Whoa. The study, by the way, that study was done by creationists. The study confirmed that the source of error was excess argon trapped in the lava during crystallization. From where, it doesn't really matter too much. In other words, the argon measured in the sample did not originate from the in situ radioactive decay of potassium, uh, parent potassium 40 isotopes, at least not since the, uh, the volcano erupted. So assumption one was incorrect, leaving, yielding a false state. While a rock is molten, much of the gaseous argon is not effectively escaping the system, resulting in, in this case, greatly inflated ages. The second example is the labadone that formed in the crater of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. This stuff was done by Steve Austin, by the way. Um, the actual age of the rock, let's see, the, the yeah, formed in 1984, crystallized in 1986, the actual age of the rock, providing geologists with an opportunity to test the reliability of the potassium argon method. Pull some of that stuff up, send it off for a date. A decade later, five samples, one whole rock sample and four component minerals were sent to Geochron Laboratories. As before, no information was provided about where the sample was collected collected or the actual age of the rock, though the laboratory technicians were again advised to expect low argon. The results of the potassium argon analysis indicated that the solidified lava dome was anywhere between 340,000 and 2.8 million years old. Furthermore, different crystals within the same rock samples that yielded different ages. One of those is the the lowest dating crystal and one of those is the highest dating crystal. And the whole rock age was somewhere in between. The most reasonable ex explanation for this discrepancy is that excess argon, that is, not from in situ radioactive decay of apparent isotopes, again, since the lava was hardened, theoretically could be from before, but certainly not since. Possibly inherited from the mantle was incorporated into the lava prior to crystallization. Interestingly, the mineral pyroxene with the tightest crystalline structure dated as being the oldest. It's also the lowest potassium, which makes sense. This may be because its tighter crystalline structure allowed for great ar greater argon retention and as a consequence dated much older than the other minerals. 
Put more simply, argon is not being excluded from the molten lava as, tip, as is typically assumed. Other researchers have come to similar conclusions. For example, Broadhurst and colleagues report in Geochemica at Com Cosmochemica Acta journal, a respected journal in this field, that the solubility of argon in the minerals is surprisingly high. In other words, argon does not appear to, be, to readily escape from the lava prior to crystallization as is commonly assumed, refuting assumption one. These researchers concluded that non-radiogenic argon was retained in the lattice vacancies of the minerals, giving the superficial appearance of great age. Many other examples of exaggerated ages have been reported in the scientific literature, table one, which we will see shortly. Dalrymple reported in Earth and Planetary Science Letters the age of five historic lava flows. Each yielded dates that greatly exceeded their true ages, for example, a rock that formed just 85 years ago, not 85 million, 85 years ago, from a lava flow at Mount Lassen, California, dated to over a quarter million years old. I think it erupted in 1914 for historical purposes. Um, Hulalai basalt that formed between 1800 and 1801, this was witnessed historically, just 200 years ago, potassium argon dated to 1.6 million years old. A year later, Dr. Krumenacher, potassium argon dated the same lava flow in Hawaii. The new date was over 16 million years old. Wow. Now, for what it's worth, um, I have to be fair also in this one, the, the Dalrymple reporting, he reported those five excess ages. He reported, I think it is 15, uh, zero, not distinguishable from zero ages. Uh, he then reported three ages that actually gave negative ages. We'll come back to that. That becomes important. In other words, those eruptions haven't happened yet, if you believe potassium argon dating. Um, and we'll explain exactly why that is, and it becomes important. Um, now, Stromboli in Italy erupted in 1963. That's not part of Dalrymple's uh, data. Samples collected from the site dated to two million years old. Many additional studies published in Nature Science and other peer-reviewed geological science uh, journals say much the same thing. And you can see some of the, uh, the references. And here's their table. And if you want more detail, look at the book. It has um, more detail on it. But you will notice that uh, some of these are from the, from the Dalrymple article that we just referenced. None of these are creationist. There's nothing from Mount Ngarongo or whatever it is in, in um, New Zealand. There's nothing from Mount St. Helens in there. These are all other ones. These anomalous dates are not due to systematic errors in the analytical procedure or the equipment. The excess argon is real and measurable. All of these studies and many others have confirmed that excess argon is routinely trapped in lava when it cools. There's some experimental production of mica which shows the same thing. The argon does not appear to be ex effectively degassing from the system. Studies have indicated excess argon is readily retained in the minerals during crystal crystallization. So much for assumption one, little or no concern. This undermines the most fundamental assumption of potassium argon dating. The daughter atoms, argon-40, measured today do not consistently derive from the in situ radioactive decay of parent atoms, potassium-40. This gives a superficial appearance of great age. The official USGS um, website acknowledges excess argon as a cause for concern. The conventional potassium argon dating, again, this is, these are uh, long age people saying this. The conventional potassium argon dating method depends on the assumption that the rocks contain no argon at the time of formation and that all subsequent radiogenic argon, that is argon 40, was quantitatively retained. Under some circumstances, the requirements for successful potassium argon dating may be violated. 
If excess argon is present in the rock, the calculated age dates are too old. The New Mexico Geochronology Research Laboratories at the Institute of Mining and Technology caution similarly stating argon loss and excess argon. Now I want you to think about that. What that means is if you want to, you can explain anything you want. Well, if it's too young, it's argon loss. If it's too old, it's excess argon are two common problems that may cause erroneous ages to be determined. Excess argon can cause the calculated potassium argon age to be older than the true age of the dated mineral. And presumably the part that they omitted was that uh, argon loss can ca cause it to be dated too young. In Geological Society of American Bulletin, Cumbest and colleagues affirm a significant problem in potassium argon isotopic dating is the sitting of excess Argon-40 acquired by minerals from their environment, that is argon-40 not produced by radiogenic decay within the mineral. Again, it may, may or may not be produced by radiogenic decay, but what you can say is it wasn't produced by radiogenic decay since the time of the um, melt or whatever the uh, uh, production of the crystal was, or the glass for that matter. Morozova and colleagues make the same observation. Potassium argon dating is based on the decay of potassium to 40 argon. I say I didn't put that up. Argon 40. A major constraint is the possibility that a mineral may contain excess radiogenic argon, which results in anomalously high ages. Pultz et al. acknowledge further that the process, uh, presence of excessive argon is ubiquitous in basaltic rock that formed from recent eruptions. It is for this reason that geochronologists have largely abandoned the potassium argon method in favor of improved techniques such as argon-argon dating, which can allegedly detect excess argon. Now, I will have to say that statement is not quite true. The real reason for potassium argon dating moving to argon-argon dating is because it can detect argon loss, supposedly. We're going to go into that in some detail. Yet it was the highly questionable potassium argon method that laid the foundation for the currently accepted hominin time scale, and indeed the geologic time scale as a whole. Later refinements were made using the argon argon method, but the general age framework was already firmly established prior to its invention and widespread use. The major breakthrough fossil discoveries were made in the 60s and old of Igorge and other sites in East Africa during the 70s, the era Donald Johansson referred to as the golden decade when the conventional potassium argon dating dominated the field. Actually, argon argon was just coming in at that point. The argon argon method was not commonly used until the late 1980s. We're gonna get into a story about that in probably two weeks. While the argon argon method apparently has improvements, it is a much more complicated process that incorporates many new potential sources of experimental error requires many new correction factors and requires many new assumptions. Moreover, the argon-argon um, uh, method fails in the same way that the potassium-argon method fails. Recent lava flows still yield dates of millions of years. Even with argon-argon, the first assumption is still routinely violated. The improved argon-argon method does not detect excess argon as successfully as we are told. Contrary to popular uh, claims assumption one and still two applied uh, still apply to this method. For instance, Einer et al. acknowledged that excess argon is not always detected. Excess argon, which would lead to spuriously old ages, can sometimes be identified from 39, uh, 40 argon argon versus 36 argon 40 uh, correlation plots. These can demonstrate a contribution of argon 40, which is not accounted for by the air correction and so does not result from radiogenic decay since the mineral was last closed to argon loss. They're always worried about argon loss. I'm re worried about retain retained argon. It is also worth mentioning that the improved argon-argon method is not an independent dating method. It is still based on the de uh, decay of potassium into argon. In argon-argon dating, the concentration of potassium in a sample is still measured, as in the traditional potassium-argon method, it is just not measured directly. Instead, a rock sample is bombarded or radiated with neutrons to transform some of its potassium-39 content, a sister isotope of potassium-40, the most common one, by the way, 
into argon-39. The amount of irradiated argon-39 is then used as a proxy to indirectly measure the relative abundance of potassium-40 in a sample. The logic here is based on the added assumption that potassium-39 is proportional to the amount of potassium-40 in any natural setting. But that is actually true for the potassium-argon method as well. Uh, they don't measure potassium-40. For, uh, they measure potassium and assume that 0.0167% or something like that is potassium-40. Um, <coughs> However, the only way scientists can know how much neutron flux to bombard, or I'm going to say actually to be precise, has bombarded a sample with, um, that is how much argon-39 to produce, is if they calibrate the system by using a sample of known age called a monitor or standard. They actually put the, they put the samples in, they put the standard in, and then they calculate how much uh, irradiation has changed um, uh, the sample by, by comparing the control that they have in there. Um, and of course the control, uh, they have to assume how much, uh, or what the age of the control is in order to assume what the age of the sample is. So it turns out that they're actually using indirectly argon, uh, potassium argon dating as their major standard. And they do that because they ha have to use a, s a, a set dose of, of uh, uh, neutrons in order to get the exact same amount of, of uh, potassium-40 turned into argon, or pardon me, potassium-39 turned into argon-39. It's a pain in the neck, um, and it's a, it's a difficult procedure. The fact that they go through all of that folderol to get a date tells you that the potassium argon dating is not actually doing what they want it to do. Interestingly, the standard of supposedly known age must be dated separately, the most, com most commonly with the potassium argon method. Thus, the age of a sample in question is usually dated using the argon argon method that is first calibrated by the unreliable uh, potassium argon method. Consequently, the argon-argon method is not at all an independent dating method and therefore cannot possibly be any more accurate than the potassium-argon dated system on which it is founded. Obradovich acknowledges this saying, the argon-40, argon-39 technique is a relative method that depends on the age of the monitor mineral being accurately known. It is therefore still dependent upon the conventional potassium argon technique being able to measure accurately the quantities of potassium and argon 40 in the monitor mineral. In the light of these findings, it is very likely that hominin, the hominin sites dated using either the potassium argon or argon argon method, including many australopith sites, Lucy, Ardi, Habilis, Erectus, etc., are all much younger than their reported ages. If eruptions occurring in recorded history, such as Mount Nagaraho and numerous other sites dated to be millions of years old, how can we be sure that the same error is not occurring when dating minerals from past eruptions in Laetoli, Hadar, Olduvai, and other famous, famous hominin sites? The rocks that are known to be young are given da giving dates very similar to the deposits at all these hominin sites, i.e. Pliocene and Pliocene ages. There is no way to know whether or not all of the measured daughter atoms were from the in situ radioactive decay of parent atoms. It is an unjustified assumption. As geologist Snelling, who is a uh, creationist, notes, because radiogenic, that is, uh, the, the star means radiogenic for what it's worth, uh, argon-40 star is indistinguishable from non-radiogenic argon-40, there is no way of knowing whether the argon-40 measured in all the samples has been produced by in situ radioactive decay of, of potassium-40, whether it is prim primordial argon-40 inherited from the mantle, or whether it is mobile argon-40 acquired from other crustal rocks via fluid transport. You can't really say how it got in there or what, but you, what you can say is that if the zero date state positive somehow argon-40 is either staying in or getting in your choice. 
The best way to test the validity of any dating method is to date rocks of known age. Whenever scientists do this, they routinely obtain dates that are much older than their true age. If we cannot trust these dating methods on rocks or ash of known age, how can we trust these same methods on rocks of unknown age? Now, that finishes their part of potassium-40. I'm going to add a little bit and then we'll uh, let you discuss. A little known secret is that the assumption that all argon is driven off from a sample is not just inaccurate, it is known to be incorrect. The formula has to correct for air argon that apparently is leaked back into the sample after all the argon has been theoretically driven out of the sample by heat. You're going to go, what? That's right. You see this section right here, 36 argon times 2 to 95.5. That is the ratio of 36, or actually of 40 to 36 in air. And so they have to subtract out the argon that diffused back in, supposedly. It's there all the time. How did it, well, did it diffuse back in or it just never got driven off? Um, and the interesting case Remember I told you about that one where those things dated under zero, that they're dating in the future by a few hundred thousand years? In those cases, there's proportionately more argon-36 than there's normally found in air. So when you put the math, you get this 40 argon, actually this, this, this becomes negative, and that's how you get a negative age the sample's date in the future. Now, there's a subtle point that can be missed easily that they don't call uh, attention to. Uh, I don't know whether they just missed it or whether it was easier to omit it, but the concern of most potassium argon dating experts is not that there's excess argon. Their concern is that argon is lost theoretically in reheating episodes. And I say theoretically because the ages are too young. So they must have lost argon somehow. But you can't tell by looking at the sample. That is to say, the samples look perfectly normal, they look perfectly fresh, they just don't date as old as they ought to. And that is the real reason why potassium argon dating has been thrown out and people now use argon argon dating because they think they can correct for that problem. And I'm going to show you how they do that. The problem is so pervasive that this whole new method has been developed to solve it. That is argon argon dating. Instead of measuring potassium, argon 40 and argon 36, which is what you normally would measure to use that formula, they irradiate the specimen with neutrons and transform a small part of the 39 uh, potassium 39 into argon 39, which by the way decays after about 300 days. So once you do this, you have to measure it within a year, you're going to lose all your data. Um, actually within probably a, a few days, uh, if you want to be accurate. And so they irradiate the specimen with neutrons and transform a small part of that uh, potassium-39 to argon-49, uh, 39, excuse me, which can then be measured at the same time as argon-40 and argon-36. So you measure, you extract the argon out, you do a mass spec to find out how much is argon-40, how much is argon-39, how much is argon-36, and then you apply the same formula you had for potassium-argon dating, only instead of using potassium, you use argon-39. This allows one to release argon by progressively heating a single crystal and making multiple measurements of the three isotopes, which gives you multiple dates. Thus, a single sample can give multiple dates on multiple crystals. This allows one to select better crystals. It also allows for more cherry picking. Um, on each crystal, and they can be different kinds of crystals as we will see, one does multiple dates and as one gets closer and closer to the center of the crystal, finishing up completely melting it, 
one reaches a plateau in the calculated age, or at least theoretically, which is then presumed to be the true age and more accurate than the early ages that have lost argon. Remember, their concern is we're not getting old enough dates. And for, um, to show you an original piece of data, I just simply Googled, um, was it, Pates, uh, it was argon, argon dating plateau, and picked the first article that popped up. So if this is cherry picking, it's cherry picking by Google. Okay, here's the theory. You have this crystal, if it contains argon 40 and argon 39 throughout the entire crystal and it doesn't matter, then you get the same age all the way across with a little statistical variation. If argon has been diffusing out, the center of the crystal is relatively untouched. And so as you heat the crystal, first you get the outsides and then you get further and further and as you get further out, you get something called a plateau age. And presumably that's the same as the plateau age over here or within you know, statistical variation. And well, what happens if there was a subtle reheating thing and some of the argon was lost? Well, most of the argon is lost from the outside of the crystal and the center of the crystal keeps all of its argon. So now you have the same stair step kind of thing, only this time um, some of this, uh, you know, you don't start from zero like you do here. You start from a, a number that was a few million years ago when it was reheated or whatever it is. And so in either case, you get a plateau which supposedly gives you the correct age towards the end. And so all they're doing is they're doing this plateau age for everything. Well, the article that, that showed this has some data. If you talk yourself into it, you can say, well, you know, the horn blend looks pretty good. It goes up to here and then it goes up to this flat age and that's 85 million years old. Here is one that goes up to that age and then suddenly jumps down to 60 million, 70 million years old, plus or minus. Um, is this plateau better than that last date? Makes you wonder. Here's one that comes up and it gives you a nice little plateau age and then zoop, up to 50. Here's a couple of them that come and gives you plateau ages of what, 40, 35,000, 35 million years. Uh, and then one of them jumps up to here. So which of them is the real age of this uh, formation at Mesquite Mountain? Well, it's obviously the horn blend because that's the most reliable mineral. Unless you really know that it should be 70,000 years, in which case, obviously, this horn blend is better. Um, then you have uh, granite wash mountains here, and here we go with a horn blend that is up in the, until you get to almost 100%, and then it goes crazy. Oh, tell you what, let's just chop off the last one because you know that's not very reliable. Look at it here and look at it there. Does that really help? Um, Muscovite, biotite, biotite, feldspar, again with crazy stuff at the end. Um, obviously 50 million years old because this one has a really nice plateau all the way across, right? The simple fact that a much more complicated method, putting stuff inside of a nuclear reactor where there's lots of neutrons and then having to monitor how much they are and the pain in the neck stuff to do it is used, shows that the simpler method is really not adequate for secure dating or no one would bother with the complicated method but it gets worse. Remember that we're dating the inside of crystals. And the further inside, the better. That's what the plateau age is. This turns out to be the most difficult place to drive out all the argon from in an igneous rock. And in fact, you remember all those dates that were zero age, but had, I mean, were, were had age, but we know that those ages aren't correct because we saw it happen. 
When dating recent samples, it is usually believed that the crystals are where the argon is retained, giving those falsely old ages. So what we're doing is, as I, as I said in my book, Scientific Theology, this would seem to indicate that the workers in the field trust old samples that they would be reluctant to trust if they were recent, and vice versa. This is particularly striking in view of the experimental evidence that argon diffusion in glass is negligible under ordinary geological conditions. Why not just do the glass for everything? Because the dates are too young. Think about that. But that's my opinion. <coughs> now it's your turn. Yes. In that last uh, sample, your, your, your sample, the, the, the Google selected sample. <laughs> yes. Uh, they did not do any 3640. Um, that doesn't, uh, uh, the, the math takes that out already. You, you say the math takes it mm -hmm, out? Mm -hmm. They use they use the formula only instead of the potassium they use, they use a, a formula that, that uses argon-39 in place of potassium. But how can they say there's no excess argon there? Like I say, think about it from this perspective. They're using this method because they're normally they don't get old enough dates. So now they've gone to this. But you're back to ordinary potassium argon dating now. Yes. Yes, the, the two methods are, are joined at the hip, shall we say. With the exception that the argon-argon method measures the inside of crystals where you almost know for certain that it isn't being reset by heat. Yeah, well, so it requires a great deal of faith mm -hmm. to say that the argon in the middle of a volcanic melt of some kind as, it's, as the crystal is being formed, all of the argon is being excluded, except for argon in the air that's way outside of the melt in the first place. The assumptions are just bizarre if you think about them. Just one, one uh, wild idea here. Uh, argon 36 and argon 40 have a different mass. Right. Probably about 12% difference. Yeah. Argon 30, 36 should diffuse faster. Uh, fractionation could be significant here. And maybe all of those ones that match uh, the air really shouldn't because the argon-36 should dis diffuse in faster. And so when they yes. report zero ages, it's not really zero ages. No, has there been any correction for this fractionation at all that you've heard of? I haven't even seen any testing to find out how much fractionation takes place. Yeah. Ideally, what you'd want to do is take some material that you exclude argon from somehow, and then you put in argon 36 and argon 40 in an atmosphere over this thing and then cool it down and see how much of it is is included in the glass how much is included in the crystals and so forth that would be the ideal experiment but nobody's done that that i know of yeah okay well i just thought to raise a question yeah, i think it's a good question just we don't have an answer yet did, did you want to okay go ahead yeah, I'm wondering if uh, the methods for dating are good only for known samples or samples for which we already have the answer, what's the use of trying to determine uh, or using those methods for older samples or presumably or If I heard the question correctly, it was, if it doesn't work for the stuff that we know what the age is, why do we trust it for the stuff which we don't know the age? I think that's a good question, and I don't think there's a really good answer for it. Now, my second question is, have you discussed this with the 
Irv Taylor. <laughs> um, let's put it this way, Irv Taylor doesn't want to get that far out into the weeds. We, we have enough fun with carbon-14. Yes? Uh, it w well, it, w it will be on. Uh, keep talking. Okay. Um, there, yeah, it's working now. The thing I haven't gotten yet, uh, it, this has been illuminating in many ways, but given all of this, aren't all of the ages, regardless of their variability, quite a bit longer than would make us creationists comfortable? Uh, yes, uh, you can say, well, okay, so it's 30 million instead of 60 million. Does exactly. that really help us any? Exactly. Um, I think that it's fair to say, yes, that's, that is uncomfortable if you can say it's really 30 million. The problem I have is um, that uh, specifically for the age of apes to man, you can find stuff laying around in Hawaii today that flowed in, pick your year, you know, 1910 to 2007, whatever, and pull them out of the ground and send them to a lab and get an age of 20 million years easily. If they flowed into the sea, you can get 40 million years. Apparently, quenching it with seawater keeps the argon from escaping or induces new argon. I don't know what it does, but it, it, it throws it off, okay? And so when somebody tells me say, that, well, we've done it to potassium argon and it says three million years, so our zero samples go beyond that. Uh, Unless somebody comes up with a, a, a method that says, you know, 95% of the time we can date flows to zero and there really are zero, um, then, I, then I have real problem with especially the shorter age dates. Now, if you want to say, yeah, but this is 250 million years old, then that's a, that's a different discussion. And I think that, that this way of treating things, dealing with 250 million years old is, uh, I think needs a little refinement somehow. Okay, and, and, and that's probably fair. And we may be dealing with some, let's say, uh, some changes in the decay constant or something like that. We could even be dealing with something that is actually old, but, but to say that you've securely dated something for two million years is just nuts. The, clearly, but that still brings me back to the original question. Now, if, uh, if the ages we would be comfortable with would expect to have very little da daughter present. Well, okay, the one thing I can tell you is this, that if you date lava flows, and they're mostly glass. That is to say, obsidian kind of thing, you know, where, where it was totally melted and hasn't had time to recrystallize. Those dates do give you recent years, but it is said that those dates lose argon and so therefore are not reliable for older dates. So they date, and like I say, they date the stuff with crystal to begin with, and that wasn't old enough, so now they're dating the inside of the crystal, mm -hmm. which is known not to diffuse out very rapidly. Uh, in fact, people can calculate how much time it takes to diffuse argon out of a crystal, and the, the numbers are, uh, suggest that, that sitting in, in a lava melt for 100 days doesn't, d doesn't adequately get rid of the argon. So they're dating the stuff that is known to give the worst dates in terms of zeroing out age. So at least for potassium argon, I'm prepared to say inherited age is a somewhat adequate explanation for the entire thing. Now, 
That doesn't mean you can transfer that straight across to uranium lead or to uranium disequilibrium, which we will be dealing with next. Um, uh, although there are, there are other issues involved there, which we'll bring up. But what I want to say is that in potassium argon, when you say that it, oh, it diffuses out of the glass, but uh, which means it's too young and means that it may be, you know, zero type too young. But the glass is the most reliable for di dating recent stuff. Then what it tells me is that they're, they're using the, the stuff I wouldn't trust to date the older. What do you mean when you say dating recent stuff? Well, I mean dating, uh, you know, lava flows that, that you know, burned a village down in, 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 in 1530 because of historical records at, say, Mount Etna. Or, you know, lava flows that went across a, a road in Hawaii and, you know, it's a paved road and you know those things weren't around 15 million years ago. Sure. Um, uh, the law of superposition holds there, I think. Um, and the crazy thing about it is that the excuse that lava flows, uh, the, the glass loses argon, is at odds with the experimental evidence that shows that diffusion in, of, of argon in ordinary glass is basically negligible. So what they're doing is they're calling something it's got to be diffusion of argon that is directly opposed by the experimental evidence. And at this point I'm going, how much, how much more strength does your theory need to have when, when it's completely impervious to experimental evidence? Now that, that all is very, very relevant. It would be very rewarding to find ages that reinforced uh, a lot of what we want to uh, be able to to understand actually yeah. happened. Now the interesting thing is, and, and this brings up a, a question, um, Dalrymple in his landmark article has five ages that are too low, old. It has 15 ages that are young enough, although to be precise, he had to use a little fudge factor to get that. It's actually probably more like 14 and six, but you know, we'll let that go for now. And then three ages that were too young. I mean, by anybody's standards, those lava uh, flows have actually happened. They're not gonna happen 300 million years in the future or 300,000 years, you know. <laughs> that's, that's just crazy. That's totally crazy. Um, and so one might assume that this is, the, this is the way it usually is, that they're about right two-thirds of the time. You know? Um, the problem that I have with that is the data that I've seen from creationists seems to have been nailing it 100% of the time went to Mount Nagarango in New Zealand, and all of their ages were off. They went to St. Helens, and all of the ages were off. And now I'm left with, who's doing the cherry picking? And personally, I'd like to see somebody go around to find stuff that hasn't been dated yet, collect some from, let's say, Mount Lackey in, uh, in Iceland, uh, maybe, uh, you know, and, and, and just date them, period. 100% and date the glass, date the, the phenocryst, date the xenocryst, date everything. The one place where I saw where somebody did something kind of like that was a, a PhD thesis by Funkhauser, and it's like 300 pages. And I can say from looking at it that 
they're getting ages of like one billion years for some of that stuff. And I, whoa. Um, these are recent flows. Uh, I have a feeling that what we've seen is cherry picking of cherry picking of cherry picking that makes, uh, in fact, I know that's the case for some of the classic articles. Uh, Evernt and Savage and I've forgotten who else did one of their classic things on showing uh, how potassium argon datings dated exactly like mammal ages with I think one reversal. But you read into it and you find out that, that for one guy he submitted 85 samples but only 10 could be used. I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm worried about people who don't report 65% uh, of the data or whatever it is. Uh, Jack's question is uh, a real one. Uh, is there that much cherry picking? I wished I knew. Well, what uh, we need to do is get out into the orchard and find out. Um, I'd like to. I'd like to suggest a uh, <laughs> an alternative here, and that is that uh, there are causative factors for these old dates. Yeah. Uh, and <coughs> one of them you referred to uh, indirectly uh, was Dalrymple's uh, study of the lava flows in Hawaii where uh, these are recent lava flows uh, dated by carbon-14, just a few thousand years old. And they go down to about 39 million years. But the I think this one is 44, but yeah. But uh -huh. The interesting thing, uh, and this is a complication of what Jack, you do get a sequence as you go deeper. I, the rate people even found that. The uh, interesting thing is that they go down these lava flows and they also get a sequence and here here's a recent lava flow and they get they go down further and they get older and older potassium argon dates if you get it under seawater it really goes up and uh yeah well it goes into just what 30 40 million dollars uh, years yeah down yeah. towards the bottom for a recent lava flow underwater yeah now, uh, getting back to a favorite topic of mine, the flood. <laughs> hey, that's underwater, isn't it? Hey, well, you've got, you got a sequence underwater here, don't you? It raises some interesting questions about the 18 million year old flow of the Columbia basalt that at its edges has pillow basalt uh, in it. And what, you know, well, they, they get, they get uh, sequences and pillows, you know, from yeah, the surface I know. inside. Yeah, I know, I so know. But also interesting is uh, Damon and Culp's paper mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of, uh, what was it, Zir not zircon, the, um, boy, the mineral was, anyway. Uh, it's cordiorite and beryl, if I recall Cordy correctly, cordiorite. which have um, uh, no potassium of their own. And, uh, and they found all this extra, <laughs> and I mean really extra. Argon in it, for no reason. Samples that were 2.7 billion years old. That if you run it through the formula. That had over a thousand times as much argon as expected in that yeah. time. Yeah. But the interesting thing about that article is that, again, they had a sequence. Mm hmm. Uh, that the, the older, the deeper the samples were, the more ex the excess argon mm -hmm. what, that you had. So uh, there are models there that you can toy with that, uh, that uh, they thought, of course, it was degassing from the, from the uh, core of the uh -huh. earth uh, and so on, a, but... Uh, reasonable first, uh, mm -hmm. first hypothesis, yeah. But uh, you do have those sequences out there that uh, tell you, hey, uh, uh, we do get these older dates, and we do get sequences, but 
there are models that suggest that uh, this, hey, this could happen. Uh, take the flood into account. Yeah. It, well, I think th there's a whole lot of uh, research that could be done. Now the question is, who's going to fund it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you've mentioned volcanic glass. Um, volcanic glass is really not that common. Uh, we're talking about obsidian. Yeah. It's black, uh, it's very... Actually, it is fairly common. What happens is that most of the time you have crystals embedded in the glass. And so uh, you have both glass and crystals and, and it doesn't look like glass at that point. But it's microscopically there. I've never read that anywhere, but <laughs> I'd well, like to see documentation on what you just said. Uh, that's, uh, let's just say that uh, I ran across it in reading fairly frequently. Hmm. Anyway, my question goes in a different direction. Um, it just occurred to me that if, if we're looking at volcanic glass, which we are, and finding all kinds of anomalies, there's another creationist an anomaly that we need to look at. My understanding is that the older rocks have less and less volcanic glass until you get below the Cretaceous tertiary boundary that, that marks the boundary between Mesozoic and Paleozoic. Anything, any volcanic deposit, ash, anything volcanic below Cretaceous tertiary boundary has no volcanic glass. That would be interesting to see. Um, and that's uh, we do something have, people have ignored. Uh, yeah. We do have some two places to look real quickly. One of them would be the uh, Deccan traps, although I think those may be slightly post-Cretaceous, but they're, well, they're 50 million years old or something like that. Yeah. And the other one is their Siberian traps that are supposed to be Mesozoic to Paleozoic, uh, that are the same general yeah. kind of thing. So any, anybody wants to finance a, a expedition to Siberia, we can get some of that rock, polish it off, take a look at it, and see how much of it is glass and how much of it Actually, is. Actually, it's a lot easier than that. Just do a Google search. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't need to go to Siberia. But I don't, I don't even know what I'm asking. But what I'm asking is we're dealing with some anomalies. And there seems to be another anomaly. You know, there's all kinds of anomalies that as creationists we can uncover and then yeah. pursue them and see what direction they go. And I'd like to see more work done on no, I, I actually agree with volcanic you. glass. I agree with you. It would, it would be interesting for us to be able to say there is or is not volcanic glass. And that becomes important too because uh, supposedly on a very long time scale, glass slowly recrystallizes into crystals. Now, yeah. is that because it's supposed to, or is that because it actually does? Um, and s uh, one of the things that's interesting is that the fresh glass actually is the one that is most likely to have uh, uh, dates that, that match uh, zero age. And also, that's true in the, you know, in the literature, that they'll tell you that the glass you know, uh, dates one million and the crystals date six million, and so we're gonna believe the crystals because the crystals are closer to what we actually right. think it is. You know, at this point, you're, you're starting to see, let's, uh, shall we say, uh, theoretically influenced uh, selection of data. Let's, uh, let's jump into a, not only a global flood model, but a model that puts most of the geological column in the flood. It would seem like that with all the volcanic activity, you mentioned Siberian traps uh, in India, the, almost the whole northern part of the continent is all volcanic there. And um, this is near the Cretaceous tertiary boundary as they, if we the, take the time scale. Yeah, if you take that time scale, actually the, the Siberian traps I was just reading the other day are like 110 million years old or something like yeah. that. So they're so nicely they're in the Mesozoic. Mesozoic too. 
um, if you have all this magma welling up, being exuded during the global flood, you should have volcanic glass at every level coming up, and that would give a young age at every rock formation. All you have to that do is date the glass and then see what you get. That would be the silver bullet if we could come up with it. Well, as, as you know, uh, silver is pretty scarce for bullets. But <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, it would, it, would, it would add a layer of uncomfortability. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like the car finding carbon-14 in everything. Uh, it's not a silver bullet because, well, it can't be that, so it's got to be something else, and they start reaching for whatever. Yeah. But it makes them do the reaching instead of creationists, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, we could go on the offensive with that. Um, one thing about volcanic glass that is a known phenomena the the lava flows into a lake and is quenched so quickly that it's not able to form crystal structures right. very much. Right. And so that's what you would expect in a global flood. True. Yeah. True. That, so you, you can might, make a prediction there. So you can make a prediction that when we get to the Siberian traps that there's going to be a significant amount of glass still in the in there. Yeah. And if we find out that it doesn't actually go away as you go back further uh, I think that adds plausibility to the creationist hypothesis. And if you find out that that glass dates, you know, one million or two million or something like that, you know, which is well within the range of what we get today, then you're starting to say, well, maybe it isn't that old. We're probably throwing stuff at you without <laughs> proper preparation. Although the book tries, and I did add some of the uh, stuff that was in my book that was relevant to this. Um, but next week we will at least cover uh, a thorium, uranium thorium uh, disequilibrium dating. Um, we will see how much further we can get and still make it logical. And uh, uh, sooner or later I'm going to do a full Sabbath simply on the on the Skulls 1470 controversy because I think that that's really important when you realize that they have all their data agree and then they find something that won't fit and now they have to backtrack and they get all new dates that all agree now and the old ones are just kind of forgotten about uh, except by a few people who are still saying but we had it 2.6 million years, what's wrong with that? Anyway, uh, come back next week, we'll have more fun.